uh, v is alpha prime zero. Okay, v alpha zero is p. So everything happening at point point p there. So v is alpha prime zero. So what we are interested in is the orientation vector field. So this is n. <coughs> so this is, of course, uh, here or here, it's all the same. So this is vector. Uh, n whatever n plus one at the appropriate point. Okay. So so in other words, this first of all we need to so these are functions now. So so what is if we have a smooth function f on the surface not f. Eh? So usually f is reserved for the function which uh, defines the surface. Uh, okay, does not. So s is. So let's use some other letter there. H. This definition is quite the same. So this is, of course, going to be just delta, uh, the gradient at the point P. So I am not writing the point P anywhere. So everything at P. So this is in TP. So here this all uh, n, the n1, n2, n3 are all functions, right? So the, the derivatives of the functions in the direction of E is defined like this. So, so these are called the, the, the derivatives of the vector fields that we are looking at in the direction of E. So for example, if you look at the coordinate directions, coordinate uh, vectors, uh, that is, if you look at, say, so this is just going to be the partial derivative. Because this is the directional derivative of the function in the direction of V. So this is the derivative in the jth coordinate direction, it's just the partial derivative there. So the derivative of a vector field is defined in terms of uh, the derivatives, the directional derivatives of the functions which give you the vector field x. Now here if you want it is x1, x2, xn plus 1. So right now we are going to look at only the, the vector field n. So our definition of uh, LP was so you want to see first of all where this object lies right we want to say in fact that it is in the tangent space so in other words, we want to say that it is perpendicular to the normal, right? So, so take your n, look at n dot n. I'm omitting the arrows, okay? So, n dot n is a scalar valued function smooth, so on. So what is its derivative? How, 
how do you uh, differentiate uh, dot product? Usual uh, product rule kind of. So derivative of this dot that plus this dot derivative of that. So of course here both are the same. So you are going to get two times. But then uh, n is an orientation vector field, so it's a normalized normal vector field. These are all unit vectors, right? So n dot n is 1, the constant function 1. So when you differentiate the constant function, you are going to get 0. Right? So, so what is the conclusion? This is 0. So that means del V n is orthogonal to n. Okay? So, R in other words, normal, I mean, orthogonal to the normal means it is tangent. This is also going to lie in the tangent space. So, for any tangent vector V, LP of V is again a tangent vector. And therefore, LP is a map from the tangent space to its DP. Right? But what kind of a map? Actually, you want it to be linear map because you are in a vector space. But linearity is not difficult to see from this. So what is, for example, see, f is right. So the components of this are all, so what is this? P N1, so on. Okay? So these are all functions. So this is going to be the gradient of N1 dot V plus W. So that is same as gradient of uh, n1 dot b plus gradient dot w. So v, v and w can be separated. So this is so I can write plus W. So this is so this uh, derivative is linear as a function of the vectors, tangent vectors there, as a function of V. This is linear. Of course, scalar multiplication also you can see uh, uh, much easier. So that gives you linearity of LP. And
so uh, on the tangent space at each point of the surface you have a linear map like this so this linear map is self adjoint or symmetric if you want to because we are only in the real case so it just means that the uh, inner product of lp v w is same as inner product v lp w so this is uh, just a uh, straightforward computation okay just move this up a little apply this del v so this is lpv dot w so you have to use uh, product rule kind of right but then this part is going to vanish because this is orthogonal to the the gradient vector field is orthogonal to the tangent space so the first term will go off and then when you compute the second term there uh, you will end up with something of this kind the second partial derivatives right when you well, differentiate it once you will get the first partial derivative there when you apply the dot product there and then now you have to so you have to take the dot product of the whole thing with w and then you will get one more partial derivatives like that so you can do the same thing with the other one the only difference is going to be the change in the order of taking partial derivatives so here you will get uh del x i del x j and the other one you will get del x j del x i so in general of course you know this may not be equal to this always but if the fu function is sufficiently smooth then this is going to hold for, for example if the function is c2 or something continuously differentiable twice if the second partial derivative exists and are continuous then they are going to be equal now for us all functions that we are looking at are smooth functions c infinity functions so there is no problem about the equality of the mixed partial derivatives right the order in which you differentiate it does not matter so essentially the self adjointness of the wengarsen operator is a consequence of the fact that the mixed partial derivatives are equal so once you have this uh, fact that the operator lp is self adjoint you can invoke your linear algebra any self adjoint or symmetric operator is is what is diagonalizable or what is the same there is an orthonormal basis for the space consisting of eigen vectors of the operator yeah. so whenever this is a finite dimensional case so whenever you have an operator which is self adjoint there is an orthonormal basis for the space whose elements are all eigen vectors of the operator that you are looking at this is what is called the spectral theorem the finite dimensional spectral theorem um, so what is that you are doing now in functional analysis you have come to compact operators hmm? compact self adjoint operators a spectral theorem for compact self adjoint operators have you seen hmm not it or you have see the the result is 
valid and more generality. We are, of course, in the finite dimensional case, everything is nice, easy. The, the statement is true even in a more general setup. If, if you have a, uh, let's say, just for uh, convenience, let's say you have a Hilbert space mm, and a compact operator on a Hilbert space, which is normal or uh, self-adjoint is okay, good enough. Normal, you can even take normal if you want. Uh, so let's take a self-adjoint compact self-adjoint operator on a Hilbert space. Uh, then again, the space has an autonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors of the operator that you are looking at. Uh, so uh, of course, the only difference is that uh, in general, the set of eigenvalues may not be finite in a general Hilbert space. Uh, nevertheless, the result is true that there is an orthogonal basis for the Hilbert space uh, whose elements are all eigenvectors of the operator that you start with, which is compact and self-adjoint. Of course, if you drop compactness, then things are different. If you look at any bounded self-adjoint operator, then this is no longer valid. Compact operators are a kind of uh, generalizations or approximately finite dimensional operators. Okay. Of course, this in, in a Hilbert space, this is literally true. You can approximate any compact operator by a sequence of finite rank operators. Not true in general Banach spaces. Uh, this, is a, this is a problem about uh, the famous problem regarding this. But we will not talk about it now. Uh, yeah. So, but at let, let me at least mention uh, that if you drop compactness. The operator may not even have an eigenvalue, let alone talk of uh, basis of eigenvectors. See, in the finite dimensional case, how do you get your eigenvalues? They are all roots of the uh, polynomial, whatever that is, a characteristic polynomial, whatever it is called. And you know that. Uh, Polynomials have roots, thanks to the fundamental theorem of algebra. All right, the complex case. Of course, in the real case, you know, in the real case, it's not true that uh, you always have real eigenvalues. So, but you have complex eigenvalues. But if you, if you are in the symmetric case, self-adjoint case, a real symmetric matrix will have real eigenvalues. No problem. But if you drop symmetry, then you may not have any real eigenvalues, but even the complex case, uh, the existence of uh, eigenvalues that any operator, any matrix has a, an eigenvalue is a consequence of the fundamental theorem of algebra. So you need some complex analysis there. Uh, but in general, in the absence of finite dimensionality, this is no longer true. Okay, so there is no finite matrix in that case associated. There is no basis even in general <laughs> uh, in, 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 in any reasonable sense. Okay. Um, but uh, if you restrict to compact self adjoint or compact normal operators, then there are always eigenvalues. Okay. In fact, uh, the point is that the the eigenvalues, in fact, even the the spectral values are countable, and except possibly zero, all spectral values are eigenvalues. 
all members of the spectrum of the operator except possibly zero if or necessarily eigenvalues in the case of compact operators okay but if you don't have compactness eigenvalues even a self adjoint a bounded self adjoint operator uh, may not have any eigenvalues for example multiplication by if you take l201 for example uh, look at the operator uh, multiplication by function x identity function f going to x times fx right so this is a self adjoint bounded operator it has no eigenvalues and self adjoint is also is important compact out operators themselves may not have eigenvalues the volter operator for example uh, again take uh, l201 uh, look at v of fx equal to 0 to x ft dt is a volter operator is a compact operator not self adjoint so on v or on c c01 if you want on or l201 which were you want so this defines a bounded compact operator having no eigen values anyway so what what goes wrong you see in the finite dimensional case you, when an operator linear operator you have the rank nullity theorem right so consequence of that is that the if the operator is 1 1 it is on to right operator from the space to itself okay if it is on to it is 1 1 so an operator is 1 1 if and only if it is on to this is no longer true in the infinite dimensional case that's the underlying reason why you don't have this kind of thing in general infinite dimensional spaces but anyway so this is all beside the point that we are looking at Uh, just to say that the eigen uh, in the case of uh, self adjoint operators you have a basis an orthonormal basis made up of eigen vectors of the operator that's the basic thing here and you can actually explicitly in this case say what the eigen values are going to be you look at the so in um in functional analysis what is usually called at the as the uh, it's enough if you look at oh that in a brings us to this quadratic form that we want to talk about so you just look at this lpv so this is a quadratic form defined by lp okay you if you confine yourself only to the unit ball that is you assume that the v is a unit vector okay so so we are in the finite dimensional case the unit unit ball is a compact thing and so on so if you you can look at say the maximum of this numbers this uh, function the function of v okay the continuous function the function of v so you look at the maximum of this function on on the unit sphere okay so that is going to be an eigen value okay and then you can proceed like this so you take a corresponding eigen vector v1 okay so uh, lambda 1 your maximum of uh, this over the unit sphere and then so call it lambda 1 that is going to be an eigen value take a corresponding eigen vector and then what do you do look at the orthogonal complement of 
v1. So look at all vectors which are orthogonal to this one-dimensional eigenspace that you have. So you can restrict that to that subspace, the dimen one dimension less than the original space. Okay. So you can you can look at you do the same thing on that subspace rather than the whole space. So look at the orthogonal complement of v1. Look at the same quantity, but now on the unit sphere on the subspace, the orthogonal complement. So that will again be an eigenvalue, and you can go on up to up to the stage uh, n times or whatever times that you have to repeat. So you get a whole set of eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda n, not necessarily distinct. Okay, The maximum on the whole space can be equal to the maximum on uh, subspace there. So you will get uh, n eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors, which are all mutually orthogonal, by the way. Right? The eigenvectors, you are taking the orthogonal complement. So any v2 in uh, uh, here is going to be orthogonal to v1. So, so you get an uh, orthogonal basis. So you can normalize, of course, and uh, get orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors. Of so that, in fact, more or less gives a proof of the spectral theorem in the finite dimensional case. You use some analysis there and get this. Uh, so this this uh, operator LP, the Weingarten operator, or Weingarten map, as it's called, it, I mean, this is what is, I haven't uh, tightly put it anywhere, I didn't mention this. OK, so we'll come to this in a moment. This is called the. shape of course so it's called the shape operator because you will see that it actually uh, gives uh, in, in some sense it measures the way this surface turns around uh, the tangent at that point, or the normal at that point, both mean the same, is self-adjoint. Meaning? So as a consequence of this, in, in view of the spectral theorem, so you're going to have that, so TP has an orthonormal basis. consisting of eigenvectors of LP. So this is true for every point P. the principal directions the eigenvectors I'm sorry eigenvalues
they're all real, of course. We'll arrange them in gently as uh, increasing order of uh, increasing sequence. Uh, eigenvalues are called the principal principal curvatures of S at P. The determinant of the Van Garten map, determinant LP, is called the curvature, the Gaussian We denote it by K with a capital K at P. A trace, trace of LP, trace of the Van Garten map is the mean curvature. It's called the mean curvature. of S at P, it's usually, yeah, H. Oh, by the way, so the corollary road is by the spectral theorem. Right? For self-adjoint operators on a finite dimensional space. So, so what is KP? It's the, the, just the product of the eigenvalues, right? Of course, each of these are functions of p. I'm not it's k1 p, k2 p, k n p. K is equal to k1 k2 k n, and h is equal to the trace is just the Some of these, oh, uh, rather, I suppose, uh, one over n times this is called the mean curvature. The average, right? Mean mean means average. So it's the average of all principal curvatures. So the form defined by the Van Garten operator, the bilinear form, that means if you take LPV dot W, so the bilinear functional of V and W, so this is a bilinear form on the tangent space, so we going to Right? So, is a bilinear form on TP and is called the second fundamental form. of S. Mm. 
Uh, well, actually, usually only the quadratic form is called a second fundamental form uh, by convention. So the corresponding quadratic form is. So second fundamental form V is L P V dot V the quadratic form okay. So generally only this quadratic form is called the second fundamental form, but doesn't matter okay. okay when you take a unit vector uh, look at this second fundamental form at v so this is uh, kp if you want time move denoted by kp so this is called the the normal curvature for the reason for this term normal curvature is the following probably I mentioned it sometime later also but uh, so you have the surface you take what is called the normal section of that surface that means okay I will come to the normal s section later okay but uh, certain section of the surface is called a normal section so when you take a planar section of a surface, what are you going to get? You will get a curve, right? A surface is cut by a plane in a curve. So the curvature, so the, the section is going to be through the point P, okay? A plane, so, so uh, uh, an appropriate plane through the point P. So it gives you uh, a curve which lies on the surface of course and then uh, so this is a planar curve so you have what is called a curvature of a plane plane curve right so this object here kv is going to be the curvature of that curve that you get at the point p okay so the the curve on the surface got by what is called the normal section of the surface at the point p that is the uh, normal curvature that's why it's called the normal curvature so it is curvature of a certain curve on the surface got by a normal section of the surface so uh, so in terms of this uh, normal normal curvature so you can describe all your Reagan values now. So the way I described earlier, you take the maximum on a unit sphere. Okay. Maximum of KV. So all this KP, P is there always at the point. Uh, we have not mentioning every time. Over the unit sphere. So this is your Kn, the largest of the eigenvalues, okay? And then the next one is go to, so V in Tp, of course. the same object but now V in V1 orthogonal complement so V1 is uh, 
not V1, but let's say Vn, okay? It's now Kn, so where Vn is an eigenvector corresponding to, so Lp Vn is Kn Vn, okay? So Vn is a unit vector. unit eigenvector for so this is the maximum of the same thing of k v so on right so the first eigenvector k1 is going to be what it's going to be the minimum of What will be the easiest example of a surface is the plane. Uh, of course, only then you, this you get the sphere, right? Sphere is a normal one because the plane is plane, so it's not really a surface that you imagine. But anyway, so so plane, sphere. Let's see what what these are. Uh, the, what the Weingarten map is, right? So what is going to be if you take a plane, so what is the Weingarten map? You know what this is. You can write n itself, okay? So n itself is uh, one over so on this we have done repeatedly so so what is This is what P right. But what are these now? N one I mean there are only three of them now. So uh, N one, N two, N three, okay. So So n1, n2, n3 are all constants now, a, b, c, or something. Mm. So when you differentiate, you're going to get zeros, right? Which means the Weingarten map is the zero map. Hmm? Correct? So, uh, nothing to talk about, right, in this case. Because, I mean, the, the plane doesn't turn anywhere. So, it remains the plane. So, the curvature is going to be zero. All things are zero, right? K, Kj equal to zero for all j, so k equal to zero, and so on. What about the sphere? Let's take, a, for a change, let's take a sphere of radius r or something. Uh, yeah, we can take an n-dimensional sphere if you want. It's the same thing, okay? So now you have to fix the orientation, that is fix the normal direction. If you take the inward normal, for example, it's 
what are the two na so you have only one normal either outward or inward so outward is now it's not one so you will have q over r now r minus q over r q over r will give you the outward normal minus q over r will give you the inward normal so if you take the inward normal say the inward normal when you normalize you will get this factor r here in the denominator so what is uh, this now what is del v of n at any point p is going to be so what are going to get p dot v so you see what are the components here you are going to get right this is what it is this one okay but what are these the components are x1 with a minus sign x1 x2 xn uh, x whatever xn plus 1 mm. if you if you are taking this case otherwise xyz mm. so you will have so this is this is what del v nj is is going to be del v uh, with a minus sign there with uh, x, x j right the coordinate functions so this is going to be uh, del f del del f means x j okay dot v but gradient of the coordinate functions are the partial derivatives so partial derivative of the function identity function x so this is the identity function here okay so you are just going to get r varo yeah i am uh, yeah n so i am write, just writing this then we will divide by r okay so you will just get vj right j coordinate So you will just get Q or P, whatever it is, uh, with a minus sign everywhere. V1, Vn. Okay. So, ah, divided by R, one over R, and then you have. So this is. delta v of h is delta of h dot v right so we're going to have lp of v is there is uh, one more minus so that's why i took the minus there the inward normal rather than the outward normal so you just get the identity function multiplied by r 1 by r If you take outward normal, you will get minus 1 over r times that. So the curvature will be 1 by r, right? Uh, curvature generally means uh, Gaussian curvature. Okay. So the curvature of, of a sphere is the reciprocal of the radius. So this in some sense you see conforms to our perception if you have a small sphere it curves more right if you take a large sphere uh, locally it looks more or like 
flat, right? The surface of the earth, for example, <laughs> that we are standing on, so we perceive everything to be flat, more or less. So because the lady is quite large. So larger the radius, smaller the curvature.